This is the early career researcher presentations. Woohoo! <laughs> okay, great, lovely. Um, if I can have all the early career presenters in the front, that would be amazing, just to save some time because you have three minutes to present and then we have two minutes uh, for questions and I will be managing the questions. Um, and I will only say a few words, which will be the name of the presenter and their organization. And we are starting with Arshal Lohakari, sorry, from Swansea University Medical School. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm going to present a topic about childhood maltreatment. Childhood maltreatment, uh, mostly like by which we by, which we mean by uh, abuse and neglect. Uh, childhood maltreatment, by which we mean abuse and neglect, doesn't. Uh, uh, it is not identified in uh, uh, primary care and secondary care data most of the time. And in order to do that, we have created a code list. Uh, these code lists work uh, like, for example, basically, the uh, first thing you can see the rubbish and rubbish out image. Uh, this means that we are we want to look at specific events and specific codes uh, in order to make a meaningful change while analyzing our data. In order to do that, we have created a code list. These code lists have been developed on previously based research uh, and uh, with the help of experts and clinicians. So we have also used an ex extensive manual search with the help of clinicians. Uh, furthermore, these code lists have been externally validated uh, using with the uh, using an external child or maltreatment data set. These data set have been created. Uh, uh, these data sets have been used uh, from like previously collected data of childhood uh, child maltreatment, which consisted of ch data of children with clinician specified ch uh, sus suspected childhood maltreatment. But we have used this data set to validate our own code list so that we can find, we, we can calculate the sensitivity, specificity, and the positive predictive value for our data set. Uh, and when we found that when compared with the previously published list, uh, our data set and code list performed uh, like with high sensitivity and greater specificity. When compared with GP and hospital admissions data set, this data set, uh, our GP picked out most of the cases while hospital admissions missing more than 80% of the cases. This might be because hospital admissions doesn't have child protection codes. And uh, and also in hospital admissions, the coding system is morely focused on treating the injury and whether or not it is a result of maltreatment. So while in hospital admissions data, the sensitivity was very low, but the specificity was high. So what does this all mean? Uh, these, uh, these paper highlight the difference between GP and admissions data and how we can identify childhood maltreatment in these data set. Also, we were able to uh, we were able to create and develop code list and algorithms which uh, which we know will, will perform well and uh, uh, and can be used in healthcare settings. Also, these codes will be uh, these codes will be publicly available for uh, uh, other researchers to use and the uh, in uh, HDR UK's data mine gateway for future uh, epidemiological research in childhood maltreatment. Thank you. Questions. Do we have any questions? Yes. Hi. You have access. To, oh, sorry. You have access to family court information at sale. Sorry? Yeah. You can you can look at who presents to family courts using the sale data bank. And I just wonder whether that would be like a further thing you could do. Oh, those are the. And no. I'm, I'm going to step in simply, oh, simply because <laughs> this work is by Amanda Marshall, a marchant, and Harshall is presenting for her. He's only been on the team for two and a half months, and he's presenting for her because she couldn't be here today. So, so you know, kudos. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right. Yes, we have access to CAFCAS data and family court data, and we could do that, and that may be... A way, I hadn't thought of it, a way of further investigating these code lists. We just use primary and secondary care data because there were a lo lots and lots of lists out there 
um, doing childhood maltreatment. And the, the one we got here, which used them, but also used clinicians and then validated against the safeguarding data set, performed the best, still good, but not brilliant in some ways. Um, but that is a way forward. It's a, it's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm sorry, Harshal, for stepping in, but he's really new. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next one would be um, Ruth Blackburn from UCL Bosch Institute for Child Health. The green one. What I point it out. <laughs> Oh, oh, perfect. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Ruth Blackburn, um, a senior research fellow at UCL at the Institute of Child Health. Um, so, young people with urgent mental health needs often have few alternatives but to go to the emergency department. And for this reason, emergency hospital admissions to acute hospitals can signal some really important gaps in mental health uh, provision, particularly for schools and communities. However, as you've just heard from the previous talk, these admissions reflect really only the tip of the iceberg and they greatly underestimate the burden in the community. So uh, in this study, um, we used emergency hospital admissions relating to manifestations of stress. So that includes these physical health symptoms, pain related code clusters, self-harm, um, internalizing and externalizing mental health behaviors. So in the past, when we've looked at these, we found that the burden is really significant. So around about 8% of girls and 4% of all boys between the ages of 11 and 17 years will have one of these types of hospital admissions. And not only that, but they account for about 30% uh, of um, all emergency hospital admissions for that age group. So we use the eChild database for this study and that's linked education and hospital records. It covers pupils and young people for the whole of England, um, which is obviously a real strength. And what's quite novel about this data set is that because it's the first time that hospital and education records have been brought together at such scale with coverage of the whole of England, we can look at children and young people's health within their school peer groups. So in this study, we looked at 2.9 million children and young people. So that's all young people who are enrolled um, in schools in the 2018-19 academic year, which is the last year before the pandemic. What we found was that 1.2% of these people had a stress-related hospital admission within that single academic year. So you may think that 1.2% sounds low, but when we consider the school's perspective, actually 95% of schools, or a little over that, were affected. Um, and with the average size school, including 11 pupils with a stress-related hospital admission. We found that both school and pupil characteristics were important, particularly those with uh, long-term health conditions, social care involvement, um, persistent absence and exclusion being most strongly associated. So I think what these results demonstrate is the value of these cross-sectoral linkages for population mental health. Um, and that even though we're only looking at hospital admissions, and this is just the tip of the clinical iceberg for mental health, the vast majority of schools were affected. And that's particularly schools with higher intakes of pupils with vulnerabilities that span across health, social care and participation in school. Thank you. Your research is based on what ethnic background, like, is it? Uh, it's all children and young people in England. So uh, what, what age group, up to what age group? Um, so for this study, uh, 11 to 17 year olds. From your studies, what is like, you know, what you can say that um, what ethnic background is highly affected? Actually, we didn't find many differences by ethnic backgrounds. Um, I would say that there are problems with the way that ethnicity is recorded in hospital episode statistics data and in the National Pupils Database, which is the school data that we used. Um, and we didn't actually try and validate, cross-validate across those two data sets for that. Um, 
But yeah, certainly our early findings were that there weren't huge differences across different ethnic groups. Are you planning to do like post pandemic research as well on this? Because it was. Yes, time. very much so. But the pandemic really has created a, an, well, a real data challenge in terms of the fact that the way in which data was collected and the periods of availability are quite different, particularly for the education data. So most likely we will look significantly after the start of the pandemic um, rather than trying to look at during the pandemic period. Although I would just flag that there's a paper that's already been published which uses health data alone and looks at the pattern of these stress presentations during the pandemic um, and illustrates that they drop right off during the first waves where people were concerned about coming into hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Ford for Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Thank you. So this study is about the views of people living with HIV on sharing their HIV status data in databases for mental health and well-being research. So why did we do this? Well, people living with HIV can now expect to live long and pretty healthy lives, but they may be more susceptible to certain long-term conditions as they age, such as cognitive impairment, and to mental health problems throughout their lives. And longitudinal NHS databases would offer excellent data sources for understanding the conjunction between HIV and mental health, except for the fact that <clears throat> due to a legacy of stigma and discrimination, mostly HIV codes are removed as data is uploaded into these NHS databases. So they're not available. It means we can't do this research on a cohort of patients living with HIV. So our aim was to go out to people living with HIV and ask them, what do you think about your data, HIV status data being shared in these databases? And what would your priorities for research be if we had your data? We conducted three online deliberative focus groups, each of two hours with 36 people living with HIV. We gave them information presentations on data governance, privacy and the law, and also on the possibilities for research with these data sets. And we facilitated breakout discussions. In terms of results, participants were optimistic and fairly enthusiastic about the research and healthcare improvement that could result if their HIV status was shared. And in fact, some of the participants wanted us to stop treating HIV as a special or especially private condition. One person said, by singling out HIV as a medical condition, you're just perpetuating the stigma around it. The more we tread around it with eggshells, the more we're just giving fuel to the fire that we should be ashamed of it. We asked them what their research priorities were, and the most common things they talked about were understanding the mental health, the quality of life, and the social context of people living with HIV. But they also hoped that integrating data would help us understand more about the conjunction between their HIV and the other conditions they live with. So someone said it would be really good to have some more research, better linking up of where people are seeking psychological mental health support through GPs and IAPT. And another person said, if we have another long term condition alongside our HIV that we're living with, we can often end up playing ping pong between different specialties because their HIV doctor didn't know how to treat their long term condition and um, their other consultant didn't know how to, to treat the HIV. But all participants were concerned about being re identified through data breaches and consequent discrimination, stigma, and stereotypes. They were worried that as a group of people, they would be seen as problem cases rather than people. So I, these are our recommendations that people with HIV are, are cautiously optimistic. Um, we could start considering data governments to shift to include HIV status, carefully ensuring privacy. And our recommendations would be that people living with HIV are core team members as that governance model develops and uh, we should include them as co-researchers on any subsequent projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? This is going really well. We have Kathy in the back, please. Hi, thank you. That's It's a really, really important area. My only comment is that I wonder whether 
you could consider strengthening your recommendations. I think people with HIV and similar conditions that are routinely excluded from data sharing enterprises are missing out because their, their data are not being included, their conditions are therefore not being studied. It's true of a lot of sexually transmitted diseases. It's true of quite a lot of mental health conditions as well. Mm. So I, I, I wonder if I could encourage you to be bolder. Okay, thank you. that we have time for another question. Yep. I completely agree that um, it would be highly desirable uh, for, um, and, and potentially a benefit to people living with HIV if we were able to link data. Um, but there are huge historical impediments given that they're cared for in STAI clinics, mm. which are traditionally have made a cast iron promise to anyone attending that their data won't be linked and won't, be, won't even be re-identifiable mm. uh, within NHS data. So have you talked with them about the practical, you know, what, what practical uh, steps could be taken to mm. overcome that very clear historical uh, way of doing things? Yeah, so I come from Brighton, where um, we have a large population of people living with HIV, and about 90% of them have informed their GP of their HIV status, which they don't have to do, but they have. So we were hoping to find it in our primary care data. Um, we approached our, our Sussex integrated data set, and they returned about 40 or 50 codes for the whole of Sussex of HIV, when we know there should be 3,500 people living with HIV in Brighton alone. So... Um, we knew there was a problem, which is why we did this study. Um, but as you say, the, those dumb clinic, sexual health clinics are not uploading into our integrated data set. So that's another thing we need to look at with our kind of IG leads within our integrated care system. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Great. I'm pleased to invite Owen McElroy from Ulster University. Thanks, Louise. So over the past number of decades, uh, researchers all around the world have gone to great lengths to collect really valuable data that can help us understand the development of mental health problems and the factors that we need to be targeting to help people. This research can be extended even further if we can link and combine data from multiple sources, multiple studies, not just um, to increase statistical power by increasing sample sizes, but also to um, examine how mental health develops in different contexts, maybe across different countries, across time. But as most of us know, we tend to work in silos in mental health research, and more often than not, there can be quite large uh, inconsistencies across different studies in, in mental health um, in the way we define things, the way we, we measure certain variables. If we look at something like depression, there's estimates that there are over 200 uh, questionnaires to measure depression and they can differ in lots of different lots of different ways. So to facilitate research around the world, we are developing Harmony. Um, Harmony uses, it's a free to use online tool that uses natural language processing to uh, match questionnaire data based on its semantic content or, or meaning. So say you have two, uh, you, you're, you've got data from two different studies, they use two different questionnaires to measure depression. Um, if you have that questionnaire data, uh, the metadata in simple PDF form, you can drag and drop it into Harmony. It will match questions across the instruments based on their content. It will give you a, a kind of rank ordering of, of uh, how similar questions are uh, and uh, provide you with a, a kind of quantitative indicator of, of the degree of, of similarity. Um, in developing Harmony, we tested uh, 10 different uh, NLP algorithms um, to try and see could they match a kind of harmonization task that was completed by human uh, researchers using their kind of expert judgment. And we found that Harmony uh, basically came up with the same results uh, about 80% of, of the time. Uh, the most effective model for this was the, the multilingual sentence bird model. Um, to give you some context, uh, some previous harmonization work I've done, we found that if you have two different humans uh, do a similar sort of task, 
they'll they'll come up with a, a matches on items again about 80 percent of the time um, so as part of welcomes mental health data prize we're continuing to, to develop harmony both the usability and the functionality and um, so if you want to give it a, a try our website harmonydata.org is is available we'd love as many people as possible to use it if if you have any problems we'd love to hear about things that don't work as much as things that do work or any feedback please get in touch so thank you Well done. Do we have any questions for Owen? So can I? Oh, yes. So it's, it's Katrina from KCL. Uh, what's the advantage of doing this um, work over making people use the same questionnaires or uh, helping them use the same questionnaires? There, there's a couple of a couple of things. Well, first of all, whatever questionnaires we prescribe as the gold standards, uh, we, we have to assume are perfect and capture depression, anxiety, whatever mental health condition you're interested in perfectly. Um, also, do we want to just simply discard the decades of uh, and thousands of studies that are out there that use different measures? That's kind of the, the reasoning for this to help uh, maximize the comparability of what we already have. Thank you. I think we have another question. Thanks, this looks really cool. Um, I was wondering how reproducible Harmony will be, because like obviously if you continue to develop it, then if I've used it one year, will it have the same results, someone else using it another year? And that uh, kind of well, thing. every, um, that, that's a very good point. Uh, I would need, I guess, our, our data scientists to, to, to answer that. Uh, every development that we, all of this is open source, all of the codes available on GitHub, so it's a sort of version history will all be documented. So. I guess if you were to use it and cite it, you would be citing that particular version in, in time, I guess. Uh, um, and again, this is mainly as a tool to just help people facilitate kind of these decisions and add a kind of layer of reproducibility and record of how you actually matched up particular items. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Our next speaker is an, another Owen. Spelled exactly the same way. So Owen Gogarty, who's from King's College London. Yeah, two Owens is a rare occurrence, but uh, <laughs> it's spelled that way too. So I'm Owen, I'm from KCL, and I'm part of a wider research group uh, formed of the three Pan London uh, applied research collaborations. And we were asked to look at the effect of remote consultations on the healthcare system in London. Uh, and this was started during the pandemic. So we decided to focus on mental health as an exemplar area in primary and secondary care. So I talk about remote consultations. Uh, healthcare consultations can be broken down into two modalities. So face-to-face -face and remote. So face-to-face -face is a person going into their GP surgery or home visit and remote would be telephone calls, video calls or web communication. And we wanted to see if there was an association between the modalities in primary care and then outcomes in uh, secondary care and mental health. So we looked at primary care data from the Lambeth data net, and we looked at patients who had a uh, mental health diagnosis. And you can see here that we saw a spike predictable in remote consultations when the pandemic started, which is now leveled off to about a 50-50 split with face-to-face. -face. Um, and then for secondary care, we got data from the South London and Maudsley uh, Mental Health Trust, uh, through the Chris Sudanomite database. And we focused on three outcome metrics in mental health. So uh, number of emergency contacts, number of admissions, and the length of admissions. So the way we went about our study is we took groups, uh, periods of six months of primary care consultations and uh, categorized patients into two groups, face-to-face -face and remote, based on the majority of their consultations. Then we looked at the following three months, so months seven to nine, and looked at the outcomes of these, these same patients. And you can see in these graphs here that we did find a significant uh, difference in the means. So higher odds ratio for uh, remote consultations. Now it's important to note that you know, the reasons for this, there could be reverse causation at play uh, where patients might possibly have uh, some more severe symptoms and outcomes and may be less likely to attend face-to-face -face consultations and GPs may have to resort to phone calls. So this could skew some of the results, but um, 
we hope to conduct future work into the reasons for these differences and also look at other outcomes in secondary care. Uh, thanks. Speaking through these, incredible. Do we have any questions for Owen? Yep. Yeah. Do you have a question in the front? Um, can you have you got any idea why the mean length of admissions is is longer? Or my misunderstanding, I'm probably misunderstanding your graphs. Yeah. Also, basically, the hypothesis is that remote consultation results in uh, worse outcomes in secondary care. So, therefore, longer admissions lengths for these patients. Um, the reasons for which uh, we hope to find out in the next few months. But, like I said, it could be reverse causation and. A few other things, but you can see there's quite a stark difference there. Thank you. Yes, we have another question in the room. Hi, it's really interesting. I just wondered, um, given the time frame that you're doing it through, how would you um, think about the effects of the pandemic there? Would that not muddy the waters somewhat? Absolutely, yeah. So this work was commissioned because of the pandemic, and the pandemic itself is a uh, complex factor in this. So, yeah, we tried to break it up into several different cohorts of patients over this, this time period and conduct individual analysis and then pool together the results to try and mitigate the effect of this spike uh, midway through our analysis. So, I want to focus on kind of the two equilibrium periods on either side of the start of the pandemic. But, yeah, true, it, it does have an effect on the results for sure. Great, thank you so much. Our next speaker <laughs> is Vicky Taxiarchi. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. From the University of Manchester. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Vicky Taxiarchi. I'm the University of Manchester at the Center for Women's Mental Health. So I'm going to talk about what you're all expecting today, the effect of COVID-19 on anxiety and depression levels uh, on the English other population. We have covered the period up to the end of 2021, and we have performed pattern analysis considering using the data of surveys measuring the psychological distress of the participants and primary care health records measuring primary care presentations for symptomatology of anxiety and depression and medication prescriptions. So what we did very, very fast, we compared the observed rate with the red line to the expected rate had the pandemic not happened, which is the predictions we made through modeling with the, uh, the dark line. And what we found in terms of psychological distress was an immediate increase in the first two waves, these two peaks, the first two waves of the pandemic, which then balanced down to the expected levels. Now, in contrast, regarding primary care presentations, there was a decline in presentations to the GP because of the, probably the difficulty in accessing GP at the beginning of the pandemic, which though did not recover up to the expected levels at the end of 2021 and until when we had the data. So if we try to combine those two, information, although they are different data sets. And if we assume that people presenting to the primary care with anxiety or depression would have been measured with increased level of psychological distress had they been in the survey, then we found, we, we estimated that at the first wave, there were 3.1% of fewer presentations than expected with distress. And at the third wave, at the the end of the follow-up. Uh, similarly, there were 1.3% fewer presentations of people with distress at the primary care per month. And another interesting point that we found is that when compa comparing presentations for anxiety and depression to presentations for other physical conditions that had not been affected by the COVID-19, like diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and UTI, urinary tract infections, 
the likelihood of people presenting for anxiety or depression was less than the likelihood of presenting for other control conditions. So there was some reason, I, I don't really know, to be honest, um, that people with anxiety or depression were less likely to visit the GP still until the end of 2021. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions for Vicky? Can I ask whether we have any kind of similar data for children? I believe it could be done because uh, I, I haven't worked on it. I guess someone could find similarly data from the CPRD data, the primary care. Mm -hmm. And also the UK House for Longitudinal Society that we used also has uh, data on, on children and young people. Although they are, um, I, unless I'm wrong, I think they are taken every couple of years, every okay. two years. So I'm not uh, to be honest. This. Yeah. yeah. Be this. So, yeah. Katina? Hi, it's Katrina from KCL. Um, you might have said this and I missed it, but I'm really intrigued by that third graph. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't have time to go through this. These, these people who are starting on medication, when were they started if they're not visiting the GPA? Do, do you see what I mean? Or, or is it that you think yeah. the people with more severe illness were getting to the GP and they were more likely to be started? because they were more severe or something like that? I think so, yeah. We did a post hoc analysis separating repeated medication within the, the previous six months. These are monthly data. So we try to define repeated medication as having been prescribed medication within the last six months and incident medication have not been prescribed the previous six months. We did see the different, a, a difference. So this is overall but the repeated medication increased a bit at the first wave, maybe post first wave, and then went back to what was expected. But the incident went down. And so maybe went people down. weren't being taken off when they would have been exactly, previously. Yeah. Probably at the beginning of the pandemic, it, 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 it was a difficult period for everyone. I guess it might have been difficult to get off medication at that spe specific time. And yes, difficulty to access the GP to get to initiate medication at that period. So yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Our next speaker is Laura Lyle from University of Glasgow. Hi. Uh, so as we're all aware, uh, depression has a major impact on the quality of life of millions of people around the world. Uh, it's important to identify modifiable risk factors. There's increasing recognition that sleep and circadian disruption might be such modifiable factors. Uh, so not only is it the case that uh, people diagnosed with depression uh, have poor sleep as a symptom, but also chronic sleep and circadian disruption over the long term, for example, insomnia, um, even shift work, um, can lead to development of depression. Um, but most studies so far have tended to look at just one or a small number of uh, factors of sleep and circadian uh, function. And so we don't really know which factors are most important in driving these associations. Um, so we looked at uh, over 64,000 participants in the UK Biobank who had both uh, mental health data and had taken part in an activity-free sub-study where they wore an actual graph uh, for a week. Um, and from this, we wanted, we wanted to conduct penalised regression models to firstly examine um, among a set of uh, detailed measures of sleep and circadian function, there are 54 measures in total, which ones seem to be the most important in driving associations, not only with depression, but also among uh, people with depression of more severe outcomes. Um, and also using just very limited sociodemographic data, so just age and sex, alongside these detailed um, sleep and circadian parameters, can we actually predict who is at greater risk of uh, depression and within depression um, showing worse symptom profiles. Um, so for each of the outcomes, we um, conducted ridge, lasso and elastic net models and then selected the best one in terms of the area under the curve in the test data set. So the overall discrimination performance wasn't great. So for um, uh, depression versus controls, area under the curve was 0.68, which, which is you know, not poor, but not fantastic. Uh, the best performance overall was for atypical versus typical depression, um, where AUC was 0.74. 
Um, so importantly, these uh, sleep and security measures were taken at a time when we believe most of the sample weren't currently suffering a depressive episode. So even when looking at someone's overall sleep and screening function at a time when they were otherwise healthy, we can to some extent discriminate those with depression and showing worse symptom profiles. Um, but the most important takeaway is um, across all the models we conducted, the top predictors seem to show a great deal of overlap. So in most of the models, um, the most important predictors seem to be uh, subjective reports of difficulty getting up in the morning, um, of insomnia, people who nap and um, have been told they snore. And from the actigraphy, um, people who show sustain, sustained bouts of inactivity during the day and who show lower morning time activity around 8 a.m. Um, so while we might need more fine-grained data to improve uh, prediction performance, um, we've identified a set of features which could um, theoretically be, serve as markers of risk of depression and within depression of more severe outcomes. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thanks, Graham Murray from Cambridge. Um, do you have enough power to look at incident depression? I imagine that um, that measure of inactivity in, in the mornings, uh, that, that clinically strikes one as a very useful measure, but yeah, yeah how's your power to look at incident? So do you mean onset of uh, new cases yes. of depression? So we did, yeah, I don't have time to mention that. We did, um, uh, so obviously Biobank is a kind of middle to older age sample, so you don't get a huge number of completely new onset cases, um, but there were a few, so there were about, um, within this subset, there were about 320 um, cases where there was a gap of at least a year between all the data being collected and then their estimated first episode of depression. And um, reassuringly, the performance was um, very similar to um, the overall uh, depression versus controls. So. Um, so AUC of about 0.67, um, and the predictors um, were very similar as well. Thanks. I think that would be a very interesting measure, possibly a more proximal indicator, I suppose, because that might yeah. that might be useful as a sort of an early warning sign of a of a that a relapse has has started. Might be. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may have mentioned it, but can you tell me um, how correlated subjective and objective measures? Are they highly correlated? Or? They are, yeah, um, they are correlated, but um, there are clear differences. So people were asked to subjectively report um, their sleep duration, and that was um, objectively estimated. And um, so people do tend to underestimate the amount of sleep they're getting, but they are, they are pretty, pretty highly correlated. Okay. So they're probably measuring different things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And now, last but not the least, um, Edwin Wong from King's College London. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Edwin from both King's as well as the National University of Singapore. Um, today, I will be speaking about CYP2C19. Now, CYP2C19 is a protein that's one of these under the super family of uh, CYP450, which is almost synonymous with the concept of pharmacogenetics, I think. Um, genetic variants in CYP2C19 have been cataloged with something called a star allele system. It's just a way to standardize these variants, which then translate to metabolizer phenotypes, i.e. poor metabolizers, normal metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, and ultra-rapid metabolizers. Now, the link between genetic variants at CYP2C19 and uh, SSRI pharmacokinetics kinetics are pretty well established, so much so that several groups have published guidelines about changing dosage for these medications based on metabolizer status. But what's less clear is a link between CYP2C19 genotypes and actual clinical outcome. Um, so to sort of help bridge this gap, I've worked with a few researchers at King's to look at the UK Biobank um, and try to assess these relationships, particularly looking at the primary care prescription records. Now, because of the primary care prescription records, we we're able to tease out several different proxy outcomes of clinical response, including SSRI switching. Uh, discontinuation and duration, which is literally based on the data set itself, as well as a variable that we term side effects. It's a bit of crude, but it's basically where we linked the clinical event record from primary care to the actual prescription data set. Now, in doing so, we found some associations. As you can see here, we saw that poor metabolizers that are prescribed as citalopram were more likely to switch than normal metabolizers, although this has to be interpreted with some caution because there were pretty small sample sizes here. 
Now, nonetheless, uh, looking at duration as well as side effects, you also see a relationship between this poor metabolizer status and likelihood of these outcomes. When looking at this, uh, sorry, citalopram as well, you see that poor metabolizers were also more likely to discontinue than the normal metabolizers. Um, intermediate metabolizers as well here uh, were on average uh, on the drug for shorter durations and ultra rapid metabolizers were also less likely to have side effects. Again, all relative to the normal metabolizers. Now, all this is in line with what you'd expect from the pharmacokinetics, i.e. ultra rapid metabolizers uh, process it less quickly, uh, sorry, more quickly, and therefore they're less likely to manifest in side effects long-term. Now, certainly there are some limitations in the study. Uh, these measures are proxy outcomes of clinical response, uh, but there is, I think, from this, this data, some indication that there may be some effect of these unit types for clinical decision making uh, when prescribing antidepressants. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. I was just wondering if you are going to predict um, clinical response. What sort of outcome measures do you think you would use beyond what you've used here? Well, I mean. In the literature to date, most of this, these studies that do try to predict response use questionnaires, basically. So responses or self-reported responses to how efficacious the treatment is or how the side effects are. And in fact, this is just part one of a larger consortium study called CyPGX, where they're trying to do a proper clinical trial to look at how CPTNI genotyping can impact clinical response. So they will be using these self-reported questionnaires how valid they are also, I think that's a long discussion, um, but that is sort of the gold standard that they've been applying for the uh, long-term study. Thank you. Of course. It's coming in November. Bye -bye. Oh, the, the, there we are. <laughs> so I guess there's a part two also in the biobank, not just in the consortium. We have time for one more question. We have one more question in the front. Oh, yeah. Hi, can you get the microphone? Yep. Hi. Hello. There is, um, talking about self-report measures, there is a self, I can't remember the name of it, that um, allows um, patients participate, before they participate in a trial, to report their perception of their sensitivity to medication. Do you know the survey? No. Okay. <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> you, it would be very interesting to see um, how they score based on their metabolizer phenotype. Yeah, I guess because UK biomedical retrospective, we're limited here, but for the, the longer term study, I think it's something I should bring up with the uh, team. I, I imagine they should have considered this as well, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's a validator. It's just very, there is basically people who think they're going to have side effects, then are more likely to report side effects while, when they're participating in the trial. It's, that's well known, but it would be very interesting if, if that it, it's somehow related to how they were actually metabolizing the. Well, I'll do some short fighter, but it's not the SEAS, no. Could well, I mean, I really can't remember, but it could, it could well be. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you to all the speakers. I think that everybody did a wonderful job, and we should always come back from lunch doing this, so I can run around, you know, like this, and keep me, keep me and yourself awake as well. Thank you.